We live in a vast sea of energy. Everything, every atom, every subatomic particle is in constant motion, spinning eternally. Even in the cold, dark, absolute vacuum of empty space, there exists what new physics is calling the quantum vacuum flux. It is the ether of the ancients, the life force energy of metaphysics, are the random fluctuations of this vast field of potential in which space and time are embedded. Now, theoretically and mathematically proven, the question no longer is, does this zero-point energy exist? But rather, can we tap this inexhaustible resource of free and unlimited energy and manifest new technologies which are both inexpensive and environmentally safe? One thing is certain, if we continue on the course of rapidly burning fossil fuels and relying on nuclear fission, the future of our civilization is in grave jeopardy. We're at a critical juncture where the ravages of industrial pollution and radioactive waste have exceeded the carrying capacity of Mother Earth. Our finite reserves of oil and gas will be completely exhausted by the year 2025 at the present rate of consumption. Large corporate and governmental self-interest ignore this pending crisis and resist change to the status quo. The question must be asked, is this the kind of world we want to pass down to future generations? Emerging on the frontiers of science, a pioneering breed of theoretical physicists and inspired inventors are challenging the way we think about harnessing the unseen forces of nature. Despite ridicule, lack of funding, and outright suppression, they are confronting an outmoded classical worldview and ushering in a monumental scientific revolution. In this program, you will witness the groundbreaking work of tireless inventors and visionary scientists who may hold the keys to true energy independence for every person on Earth, from Nikola Tesla to the reality of coal fusion and beyond. Join us as we present Free Energy, the race to zero point. Most people would agree you can't get something for nothing. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And yet, we get our oxygen free from the air we breathe. We get sunlight free and water. That used to be free until bottled drinking water came along. But what about energy? We've always had to pay for that, whether it's wood or coal, oil or electricity. It's always been the rule that you can never get back more energy than what you put in in the first place. That's a fundamental law of nature. Physicists of the 19th century figured that out with the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. Maybe so. But science has come a long way since then. And laws? Well, there's never been one that hasn't been broken. At the turn of the last century, Nikola Tesla, the great inventor who gave us alternating current and the Tesla coil, stated, Electric power is everywhere present in unlimited quantities. It can drive the world's machinery without the need of coal, oil, gas, or any other fuel. This new power for the driving of the world's machinery will be derived from the energy which operates the universe, the cosmic energy. With over 200 patents to his name, Tesla was well on his way to transmitting electric power without wires when he ran into trouble with J.P. Morgan and the financial interest of 1901. His ambitious Wardenclyffe project to magnify and transmit power to ships at sea and eventually to provide free electricity for the whole world was scuttled by Morgan, leaving Tesla penniless and disillusioned. The wealthy industrialist of the time knew that their vast plans to wire the world with copper from the mines they owned 
would be upset if they could no longer control the supply and means of delivery. Tesla's beliefs about developing technology in harmony with nature conflicted with the prevailing American attitude at the time that mankind was put on earth to subdue and dominate nature. Little by little, Tesla was denounced as a crackpot and deleted from the historical record. At the time of his death in 1943, Tesla's truckloads of scientific papers were seized by U.S. government agencies. Who knows what ideas and remarkable devices our world could have inherited if only his genius was recognized. When J.P. Morgan prohibited Tesla from broadcasting uh, electric power overseas with Wardenclyffe Tower, he said, I can't put a meter on it, therefore I won't finance it. Uh, that literally changed the course of history, and for the past almost 100 years, we've been uh, suffering under that um, profit motive. Of course, one could say that mankind was hardly ready to handle the awesome forces Tesla had glimpsed. The 20th century would bring world wars and technological innovations far more horrific than had ever been witnessed by Western civilization. Even before Tesla, the groundwork that would lead to free energy had been pioneered by great scientists like Michael Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell. In 1831, Faraday modeled his rotating magnet and disk generator after the Earth, whose rotation around a molten metal core keeps the planet spinning in a self-sustaining magnetic field. His work later resulted in the development of the dynamo. Also called a homopolar or unipolar generator, the Faraday generator provides the basis for much of what is being done today in the electromagnetic approach to free energy, such as with Bruce De Palma's In Machine and Paramahamsa Tiwari's Space Power Generator. Repeated experiments have detected anomalous electrical outputs greater than that used to rotate the disk. But friction and voltage limitations have hampered efficiency and therefore widespread acceptance. James Clerk Maxwell, best known for his Maxwell's equations, is reputed to have set things straight with his theories of electrical properties in a way that eliminates zero-point energy. But Maxwell's more advanced work allowed for the existence of an ether, a substance finer than air, which since the time of Plato had been considered a scientific fact. Well, the prevailing belief of the time was that the vacuum was a thin material fluid, the so-called material ether which we know today is false. The ether is there, but it's not the observable material fluid. Faraday had re-established this notion of lines of force, but he thought the electromagnetic field or the electromagnetic disturbances in the ether, so to speak, was really twanging strings. The strings were under tension, and when you had a disturbance, what you really did was pluck the strings. Now, Maxwell states very clearly that he set about to actually capture exactly what Faraday was doing in his lines of force in the theory, and that's what he did. Maxwell's actual theory is 20 equations and 20 unknowns in quaternions, which is a higher topology algebra. You can do things in that that you can't dream of in doing in tensors, and you certainly can't do in vectors, and you certainly can't do with the theory that's taught at our universities. All that remains to be rediscovered and uncovered. The now famous Michelson Morley experiment at the turn of the century failed to detect a stationary ether, so classical physics presumed once and for all that it did not exist. The case was closed until quantum mechanics reopened the discussion, allowing for a new interpretation of how matter interacts with a zero point field. Most of our scientific community actually believes that empty space, the nature of, of, of space itself, is completely empty, devoid of anything. And historically, it's very interesting because in the 1800s and even earlier, they believed there was an ether, an all-pervading substance filling up space. And in 1905, when relativity theory became very popular, they said, well, we don't need this ether. It's uh, empty space is empty. Then 25 years or 20 years later, in 1925, when quantum mechanics comes into play, all of a sudden, a new energy appears in equations of quantum mechanics. And it has to be there to make the equations work. And it has to, it has to do with fluctuations of electromagnetic field energy at a very high frequency that interacts with everything. And they called this the zero point energy. And it turns out that all the elementary particles interact with this energy and it becomes a potential energy source. That's what we're discovering today. 
Well, free energy is basically, uh, and another word for it is zero-point energy. It's energy that is contained within the vacuum of space and which is virtually undetectable by any traditional means. In fact, uh, the, the energy is uh, homogeneous and isotropic, the same everywhere, the same in all directions. And because of that, it's uh, trying to extract it or measure it is sort of like the problem of trying to weigh a beaker of water underneath the surface of the ocean. Uh, what do you measure with respect to what? And that's been the physicist's dilemma. And we've gone down uh, one very large cul-de-sac this century. Uh, the cul-de-sac meaning that there is no such thing as consciousness. There is no such thing as this zero-point field or this, this place from which the energy can come. And uh, the answer now appears to be yes, because uh, theoretical physics and a number of experiments and quantum mechanics show very clearly the existence of this, this all-pervasive electromagnetic field called the zero-point field. In fact, although skeptics often point to Einstein's theory of relativity, it was Einstein who in 1920 said, There are weighty arguments to be adduced in favor of the ether hypothesis. To deny the ether is ultimately to assume that empty space has no physical qualities whatsoever. The fundamental facts of mechanics do not harmonize with this view. According to the general theory of relativity, space is endowed with physical qualities. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. The term vacuum has been used in several totally different senses. Uh, some engineers use it to mean you just pump out all the air and that's called a vacuum and that's vacuum technology. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about empty space-time. We know today, for example, the Lamb shift in quantum mechanics showed that th this exchange of energy between the vacuum and the charged particles is in fact real and generates real effects. And you can measure it. And he was given the Nobel Prize, Lamb was, for doing that kind of measurement and showing it in the physics literature. So we know it's real. Experimentally, it's detected. The Casimir shift, for example, shows clearly that it's there. And it does generate energetic effects in your actual materials. It turns out that in the modern view, the modern quantum mechanical view, if you apply that knowledge that's been gained there, what you find is that the vacuum is fiercely active. It's a fierce energy flux and going in all directions at all times. The energy density of that, as estimated by various physicists, is extremely high. Uh, for example, in one cubic centimeter, if you could take the raw energy in that cubic centimeter and condense it into mass, divide it by c squared, you would have more observable mass result from that than our largest telescope can see in the observable universe and all the stars and planets today. And so the, the energy that's there is extremely dense and extremely fierce. This drives everything that we call physical reality from the quantum level right on up to the observed level and the observed world that we live in. Everything is energetically driven by the vacuum. The Sea of Energy in Which the Earth Floats was a revolutionary book written by T. Henry Moray, an electrical engineer and Tesla enthusiast who in the early 20s began working on a device he claimed intercepted radiant energy from outer space. His solid state detector, the Moray valve, was designed with a complex series of semiconductors, high voltage capacitors and transformers hooked up to an antenna and a ground wire. By stimulating the existing oscillations of space energy, his radiant energy device ran for days, putting out 50 kilowatts of electricity. His public demonstrations attracted newspaper coverage and scientists from Bell Laboratories and the Department of Agriculture's Rural Electrification Administration. Although no one could find evidence of fraud, neither could anyone explain how the radiant energy device worked. During the 30s, developed semiconductors and transistors that were far ahead of their time. Unfortunately, as all too many inventors have suffered, when he refused to sell out to powerful interests, Moray and his family were threatened, shot at, and their laboratory ransacked. Ignored by the U.S. Patent Office, Moray quietly stopped public disclosure of the device after it was destroyed by his assistant, Felix Frazier, a 
communist sympathizer who was frustrated when Moray declined his repeated offers to take that technology to Russia. Today, Moray's sons, John and Richard, continue to pursue their father's dream. In Europe, Victor Schauberger's vortex experiments during the 1930s resulted in an advanced understanding of how the spiraling motions inherent in all natural systems reverse the effects of entropy. By studying the properties of inwardly spiraling water, he created an implosion generator that concentrated electrical charge. Victor Schauberger is one of my heroes who talked about a, a possible science based on the, the uh, inward motion rather than the let's explode everything, blow, break it up and, and uh, study the atom by breaking it up into little pieces. Let's study the atom by looking at uh, how it wants to move naturally in a spiraling motion. And the same with uh, everywhere you look in nature. Schauberger's ideas became widely known before World War II when he was coerced to work for the Nazis on exotic discs that resembled flying saucers, as well as his energy generator. In 1958, he traveled to the United States where he was told he could manufacture his devices. But he was duped into signing over all of his rights, and none of his inventions were ever developed. Returning to Austria, he died a bitter and broken man. Visionary philosopher, artist, and scientist Walter Russell's contributions to the understanding of energy are significant, even though ignored by mainstream academia. Russell's revised periodical table of the elements, based on a spiral, predicted many unknown elements and isotopes like plutonium and deuterium. His cosmological theories about the mystical nature of reality challenged physicists to think in terms of energy, light, and matter as one substance. 